So hello everyone and welcome to today's presentation. The IEEE Comstock Society here in Toronto is happy to host Professors Francisco Rafael and Professor Victor Montiero in today's presentation. The presentation is titled Paving the Way Towards Mobile IAB Problems, Solutions and Challenges. First of all, let me introduce our speakers for today. Professor Victor Montiero received a double BSc degree in general engineering from the École Centrale Lyon in France and in telecommunication engineering from the Federal University of Queira in Brazil in 2013. In 2015 and 2019, he received the MSc and PhD degrees in telecommunication engineering from UFC respectively. He is currently a visiting professor at UFC and researcher at the Wireless Telecommunication Research group, where he works in projects in cooperation with Ericsson Research. In 2016, he was invited to an invite the researcher at Ericsson Research in Sweden, where he worked for six months on the topic of LTE and R dual connectivity. His research interests include 5G architecture and protocols, 5G measurements and reporting procedures, mobility management, and radio resource allocation. We are happy to have you here with us today, Victor. Uh, also, we have for today Professor Francisco, um, uh, who received the BSc degree with honors in electrical engineering in 2005 and MSc and DSc degrees in telecommunication engineering from the Federal University of Queira, Brazil in 2008 and 2012, respectively. In 2008, he had been in an internship at Ericsson Research in Sweden, where he studied sc scheduling algorithms for LTE systems. Since 2010, he has been a professor of computer engineering department. Uh, at the Federal University of Queira in Brazil, and Professor Lima is also a senior member of IEEE and senior researcher at the Wireless Telecom Research Group in Brazil. He works in projects in cooperation with Ericsson Research. Uh, he has published several conferences, journal articles, patents in wireless telecommunication, where his research interests include radio resource allocation algorithms uh, for QoS guarantees for 5G and also beyond 5G networks in scenarios with multiple services, resources, and tenants and users. We are happy to have you both here with us today and the floor is yours. So thank you very much for the introduction and for organizing the talk. Uh, my name is Rafael Lima and I will be presenting about uh, Mobile AB with Victor Monteiro Farias. We are from the Federal University of Ceará and we are, we are also part of the Wireless Telecom Research Group. So uh, uh, this presentation and this talk is mainly based on this article that was pu recently published in the Open Journal of Communication Society from IEEE. Uh, the other authors are Darlan, Diego, and Tarcísio that are colleagues from our research group. And uh, we also have, have the participation of some Ericsson research, Hans Hanu, and also uh, Behus Maki that had great contribution to this work. So we would like to thank all the authors for this work. So what we have for today, uh, this is the summary. We will start with an introduction and motivation. And after that, I will talk about integrated access and backhaul IAB. That is the basis to understand mobile IAB. Then I will present uh, some concepts about mobile ID. And after that, Victor will present a performance evaluation based on presentation to, to, to close the presentation with the main feature directions, conclusions, and related publications. OK, so let's start with the, the introduction and motivation. So uh, 5G communication, 5G systems came to, to solve some problems and to fulfill some, some, uh, some gaps, some requirements. Uh, one of them is to, to couple with the increased number of connected terminals. Also 5G came to, to provide new multimedia data service and also to achieve high data rate and low latency. And one of the key technologies to, to fulfill the, the, those requirements was the use of the millimeter wave frequency bands. Because uh, in millimeter wave frequency bands, we have a plenty of, of uh, empty bands in order to transmit more data. However, uh, uh, with the use of millimeter wave, we had a problem about the propagation because uh, millimeter wave bands, we have a higher path loss. 
So in order to, to, to deal with this problem, we, we need a change in the way that the network is organized. So we need a network densification. So basically, uh, we, we need more base station and the base stations uh, should be closer to each other. And when we increase uh, the number of base station, we had have another problem that uh, every base station should be connected to the core network and should be connected among themselves. And the typical, the default choice to connect base station to the core network is to use fiber. Uh, however, uh, fiber is not deployed everywhere. And in order to deploy fiber, we need time because it involves training, installation, and also we have cost. The, the, the cost to deploy fiber is changed uh, uh, depending on the region of our world. So uh, it's not easy in, in all cases. And sometimes it's even impossible to deploy fiber, for example, in historical places. So all of this motivates to the use of wireless backhaul. And especially when we consider the integration of millimeter wave and advanced MIMO, this makes a wireless backhaul a good solution to the problem of network densification. Because uh, in, as I said before, millimeter wave frequency bands, we have a plenty of, of bands in order to transmit more data. So the spectrum can be used not only for access transmissions, but also for backhaul transmission. And also we have advanced MIMO, so we take advantage of diversity, spatial filtering in order to decrease interference, uh, spatial multiplexing to transmit more data in the backhaul. And uh, based on this, 3GPP in release 16 proposed the integrated access backhaul, IAB, uh, where we have a wireless backhaul using the same frequency bands of the access. And not only this, we have the same technology that is used in the access transmission to transmit data in the backhaul. So this is very uh, facilitates the deployment of the networks. And in release 18, we uh, are currently, 3GPP is currently working on the concept of mobile IB that is the main topic of this talk. So with mobile IB, I will give more detail later, but uh, with mobile IB, we have IB nodes deployed in moving nodes. So let's uh, give some concepts about IAB. Uh, let's talk about first about architecture and terminology. So as you can see in this picture in the right side, uh, we have a core network and a terminal. And in between, we have uh, some base station. So we have here the IB donor and an IB node. Um, the IB donor is a conventional uh, base station and it used the functional split of 5G network where the uh, base station is split in a central unit. Central, central unit is implemented by the high protocol layers. So it's, it's responsible for security, mobility, authentication. And uh, the IB donor also has some DUs, distributed units. The distributed units are implemented uh, uh, by the low protocol layers and is responsible for the task of the networks that should happen in a short time scale. So for example, scheduling. So this is the IB donor. And we have also the IB node. The IB node is composed of an MT mobile termination and ADU. The MT part is responsible for the wireless backhaul transmission, transmission and receptions. So the MT part of an IB node acts like a, a terminal and can communicate with the DU part of the parent IB donor. And the DU part of an IB node is responsible for the access transmission to terminals and also for the backhaul of other IB nodes that may be connected uh, with this IB node. Because although in this picture we have only two hops from the IB donor to the terminal, we uh, in IB network we can have multiple hops. So for example, we could have another IB node here uh, between this IB node and this UE. About protocol layers in IAB networks, here I show the user plane protocol. In this case, we are considering uh, an IB donor and a terminal and uh, two IB nodes. So in this case, we have one, two, three hops from the IB donor to the terminal. And let's talk about physical layer. In IB networks, we have two options. We have the in-band option where 
the spectrum, the, the frequency resources that are used for access transmission is the same, or we have a partial overlap of the frequency resources in the access and the backhaul transmissions. And we have the option of out of band, where different frequency bands, frequency resources are used for backhaul and access transmission. And this, uh, of course, has an, uh, an important impact in the interference in the system. About this, the layer two, in, about the radio link control RLC layer, we uh, the decision was the, to, to choose the hop by hop automatic repeat request. This is a, a different from the from the end to end automatic repeat request. So basically, in each hop, the the packet is checked if it was correct or wrongly transmitted, and, and then we have a retransmission hop by hop. And for IEB, we have uh, the proposal of a new protocol layer the backhaul adaptation protocol BAP layer. Uh, the BAP layer, we have the BAP layer in the IB nodes. And the main responsibility of the BAP layer is to, to forward IP packets along the networks. So the BAP layer is responsible uh, for the routing uh, and how the IP packet goes in the network from the IB donor until the terminal. Um, when we talk about IAB, it's impossible not to talk about topology adaptation. We call topology adaptation when an IB node uh, migrates from a parent to another parent. So let's see this picture here. We can see the core network and we have two IB donors. We have IB donor one and two. Each IB donor has, has a, a, his own central unit, central unit one and central unit two. And we have the connections here between the parents and the child. And let's focus in this IB node 4 here. Uh, currently, this, this IB node 4 is connected to IB donor 2. That in, in its turn is connected to the IB donor 1. Uh, if IB donor node 4 uh, changes the parent from IB node 2 to IB node 1, we have a topology adaptation. And in this case, uh, we call this topology adaptation an intra-central unit topology adaptation because the change of the parent here does not change the central unit that is responsible for this IB node 4. On the other hand, if IB node 4 uh, changes the parent from IB node 2 to IB node 3, we have uh, a change in the central unit that is responsible for this IB node 4. So in this case, when we change the central unit, we need to perform a handover request. So this involves a, a higher load of signaling. And also we need a handover of all the, the child uh, nodes uh, below this IB node 4, as well as the, the connected terminals. OK, uh, talking about now about mobile IB. Uh, as I said before, mobile IB, we have uh, that IB nodes can be implemented, can be put on vehicles. So in this picture, we can see here some examples. So we have a car with an IB node. We have buses with IB node, trains. Um, although uh, currently 3GPP is not considering uh, mobile IB in UAV or drones, uh, maybe in the future we can also have uh, IB nodes uh, in drones. So this is a typical scenario that involves mobile IB. The main use case of mobile IB is to, to enhance coverage and capacity of onboard and surrounding terminals. Um, so we, as I said before, we have a current work item in release 18. The tag of this work item is NR mobile IB. So what are the objectives of this work item? Firstly, define procedures and for migration topology adaptation to enable IB node mobility. Uh, there is also the objective of the enhancement of for mobile of an IB node together with its surface to UEs and also the mitigation of interference. This is a, a, a serious problem in mobile IB. The estimation is that the stage two functional freeze for this work item would be on March next year. And, and uh, when we talk about mobile IB, we have some constraints. Uh, the frequency bands that are considered is the FR1, so it's six gigahertz, and also FR2. And there is the constraint that a mobile IB cannot serve another mobile IB 
through the back hall. So we have only two possible hops from the base station to the terminal. And the potential benefits that we expected for mobile IB is first reducing eliminating the vehicle penetration loss because we have a, a DU part implemented, for example, inside the bus. So the MT part is outside, the DU part is inside. So we eliminated the, the vehicle penetration loss. And also to avoid signaling storms due to sim simultaneous handover. So you can imagine many uh, terminals inside of a bus and when we have a handover, all of these terminals are performing handover together. So with mobile IB, we can uh, uh, decrease the signaling load in this case. Okay. Okay, so I will pass, uh, and Victor will present the performance evaluation. I will just stop the screen sharing here. I come back later. Thank you, thank you, Rafael. So please, Victor. Yeah, share my screen now. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. Great. Uh, so uh, as Rafael presented, uh, now I'm going to present some, some of our results uh, and discussions and conclusions based on, our, uh, based on our computational evaluation that have been covered here. So let's start with some uh, the simulation assumptions and after I will present the results. So first of all, uh, we have considered okay. So first of all, we have considered uh, a simplified matrix grid as the one illustrated in this figure and we have deployed three scenarios. Uh, the first scenario, it was the a benchmark scenario was with what we called a macro scenario with where there were uh, three macro base stations uh, located at the central block, these black antennas here. Uh, the second scenario was called a macro pico scenario with the same three macro base stations of the previous scenario plus six uh, pico base stations deployed as illustrated uh, by these uh, blue antennas here at the edge of the scenario. And the third scenario uh, was called the mobile ID scenario. And there were the three macro base stations plus uh, IAB nodes deployed in buses. And we had six buses in total, like these ones here illustrated. Uh, important to remark that the MT part was deployed outside of the bus, while the DU part was deployed uh, inside the bus. And as Rafael already said, the MT was responsible for the connection to the donor, so the back hall, and it was deployed outside. And the DU part was responsible for the access link of the users connected to the mobile wide window. So uh, the, the, the DU part was deployed inside the bus. Okay, so regarding the channel model, uh, we used a spatially consistent channel model based on the 3 gpp tr 389001 uh, and it was implemented here at uh, our group. Uh, in this picture here, I present the links that we have considered. Uh, the yellow links, they were modeled as urban macro links. Uh, the green ones were urban micro, and the red one was uh, an indoor spot. Uh, also important to remark that uh, we have considered a bus penetration loss of 20 dBs. Uh, here I present the adopted TDD scheme and we have, I'm presenting two TDD schemes here. Uh, this one was considered uh, in the two benchmark uh, scenarios, the macro only and macro plus P. So in one slot, uh, both uh, both base stations were either in downlink, operating either in downlink or in uplink. And they were uh, working during the, in all these slots, they were 
either transmitting or receiving. While in the mobile IP scenario, we have considered uh, slots of silence. And when I say slots of silence, I mean, uh, for example, in this case here, the donor at slot three was not, was neither transmitting nor receiving. So we have included these slots of silence in order to reduce or even uh, avoid uh, interference between the donor and the mobile IB node. So as you can see here, uh, so the, since we have considered these laws of silence, uh, donor backhaul and node, they were not 100% of the time uh, active, okay? Uh, regarding the here, uh, we have a list of parameters which are not extensively present right now, but we can come back later if you have any question. Uh, I just would like to remark that uh, in all the scenarios, there were six buses and we considered a fixed number of total users in the system, which was equal to 72. But we varied the percentage of pedestrians and passengers. So, for example, in one case, uh, we consider that the passengers were 75% of the total number of users. And in other case, we consider that the passengers were only, for example, 25% of the total number of users. Okay, so now that I have already uh, presented our assumptions and our parameters, so I'm going to start presenting our results. So I'm going to present results related to the downlink, after related to uplink, and finally related to the links. Uh, I'm going to present an analysis related to the links served by the IAD donors. So let's start with the downlink, talking about the throughput. So these three figures here, they present the CDF of the downlink throughput of the users, and each figure is related to a different percentage of passengers in the system. So, for example, this first figure here, it's related to the case where uh, we had 25% of pedestrians and 75% of passengers. And the other one is, for example, the second one, uh, we had 50-50, so 50% of pedestrians and 50% of passengers. And we analyzed also the impact of having more pedestrians or more passengers. Uh, the dashed lines are related to the passengers and the solid lines are related, dashed here and solid here. And the solid are related to the pedestrians. Uh, the different colors, they are related to the different scenarios. So, for example, the green one is related to the scenario where we had only macros, and the blue one is related to the uh, mobile YAD scenario. So, first, first, let's analyze the throughput of passengers. Okay, throughput of passengers uh, is the dashed, uh, this dashed blue line here. In the mobile ID, the dashed blue line here, uh, we can see that passengers had almost the same throughput, that all the passengers had almost the same throughput since this line is almost vertical. And compared to the other scenarios, the throughput of the majority of the passengers was higher than the throughput of the passengers in the other scenarios here. So when you compare this dash with the other two dashes here, which are related to the other, to the benchmark scenarios, you can see that we have uh, an increase in the throughput of the passengers. And this is mainly explained by the fact that in the mobile IB scenario, the passengers were connected to the DU, DU part of the IB node, which was inside the bus. The, the link serving uh, the passengers didn't suffer from the penetration loss of 20 GB that I have already mentioned. And uh, regarding the pedestrians, we noticed that although it was good, so they are here, the solid lines, uh, although it was good when we increased the percentage of pedestrians, so going down here, when we increased the percentage of pedestrians in the system, it wasn't 
in the mobile ID scenario, it wasn't as good as the one of the macro peak, so this yellow curve here. And this is in part due to the fixed TDD scheme that I mentioned it. Because uh, uh, for different percentage of pedestrians, of passengers and pedestrians, the IAB donors, they stayed in silence for the same period of time. Thus, it could be better if, for example, we adopt a dynamic scheme taking into account the load in the system. So, for example, if one macro uh, is serving more, uh, more uh, pedestrians, then we can change, for example, uh, the TDD scheme in order to give more uh, resources to serve the UEs in the access link rather than the bank holding, for example. Uh, now let's see the quality of the transmissions in the, in the downlink. And when I talk about quality, I mean about the modulation and code scheme used, the MCS. And here we compare the pedestrians histogram of MCS. The first one is related to the macro only scenario, uh, while the second and the third are related to the mobile ID scenario. So this one is macro only scenario, and this, these two are related to the mobile ID scenario. And here I'm presenting only, I'm talking only about pedestrians. Okay, uh, why are the, uh, yes, just uh, one quick uh, note here is that uh, here, the second one is the mobile ID, but pedestrians connected to the macro. And the third one is uh, pedestrians connected to the IB nodes, which is an interesting find because actually pedestrians could also connect to the bus, not only to the macro. However, I would like to remark that regarding this third case here, the pedestrians served by the buses, less than 15% of the pedestrians were served by the IAB node for at least a couple of TTIs. And 89% of the disconnections lasted for less than one second. So it was a really fast connection. And uh, in this third figure here, we see that the pedestrians didn't use the higher MCSs. Uh, and this was mainly due to the interference, actually, because they connected to the buses due to a higher RSRP. However, when they were receiving data in the downlink from the DU part, which was inside the bus, the pedestrians suffered interference from the MT part of the bus, which was outside. And the MT was transmitted in the uplink in the back hall. So the empty part was causing interference uh, in the passengers, that the pedestrians uh, that were connected to the bus. Thus, we concluded uh, that we should define some criteria to allow the UV, to allow a UV to connect to a mobile IAB node. For example, the criteria could be based on a mean RSRP value, or we could use RSRQ instead of RSRP. So in order to try to to take into account interference, or we could, for example, take into account the time evolution of the relative position of users and buses. So, in order to understand whether the a given UE is moving together with the bus or not, in order to avoid this like one second connection. Uh, and now I'm going to present results related to the latest in the download. Here we present the CDF of the downlink latency. Uh, the dashed curves, they are related to passengers, while the solid curves, which are almost vertical here, uh, they are uh, related to the pedestrians. First, notice that the yellow and green dashed curves, which are the latest of passengers in the macro only and macro people scenarios, so these two here, uh, these curves here, they are the passengers in the only macro and macro and people scenarios, so in our two benchmark scenarios. And they activated 
latency values of up to four seconds. Thus, passengers using delay sensitive services will suffer in both cases. On the other hand, the blue dashed curve, with, I mean, uh, the passengers in the mobile IAB scenario, uh, the latency, the curve here is almost vertical. Uh, so more specifically, actually, 90% uh, of the 90% of the passengers in the mobile IB scenario had a down latency lower than uh, two milliseconds. And here in this table, uh, we illustrate that the TDD scheme uh, can also impact the latency. For example, if a package to a passenger is generated at the donor at slot five here, so it must wait until slot number 10. So the next uh, slot in which the backhaul will be on downlink. And after that, to be transmitted, of course, from the donor uh, to the node. And after, needs to wait again until the next slot number three to be transmitted uh, in the downlink from the mobile ID node uh, to the UE connected to it. So there is a, also a latency here due to the chosen uh, TDD scheme, which can, of course, we can choose other uh, TDD, TDD schemes uh, if you want also uh, to change this impact here of the latency. Okay, so I have talked about the downlink results. And now I'm going to focus on uplink. Uh, in the uplink, actually, most of the analysis, we had similar conclusions to the ones related to the downlink. However, to do, due to the different transmit power and interference pattern in downlink and uplink, some points were different. Uh, for example, regarding the passengers throughput in the macro only, uh, the green dashed curve here, it was worse in the uplink than in the, compared to the downlink. And this was mainly due to the different transmit power of the transmitter, because in the downlink, uh, the macro was transmitting, but in the uplink is the UE, the user uh, who was transmitting. So it was transmitting with lower transmit power which impacts, of course, the part of the transmission. Then the relative gain in terms of throughput in the mobile ID scenario compared to the macro only scenario was higher in the uplink. So this gain here was higher in the uplink than the, in the downlink. And something important to highlight here is that in the mobile ID scenario, the, adopt, the adopted TDD scheme had 40% uh, of the slots in the downlink and 30% of slots in the uplink. Then it was expected that the downlink throughput was higher than the uplink since we had more slots working on downlink than in the uplink. And here we compare the histogram of the MCS, so modulation code scheme usage, uh, of the pedestrians, pedestrians connected to the buses in the downlink and uplink. In the downlink analysis, I commented that the pedestrians connected to the buses suffered interference from the empty part of the mobile ID nodes. However, in the uplink, the empty part, as you can see here, uh, when the, the node here was on uplink, then uh, we can, can see that the DU part was in silence. Here, at least in these two moments here, the empty part was in silence, which reduces the interference. And that's why in the downlink, we didn't, we didn't use the highest MCS, but in the uplink, we used more the highest MCS since the interference was lower. And now let's talk a little bit about the uh, profile of the links served by the IAB donors. So first of all, let's first talk about the total number of uh, links served uh, by the macros. 
So here we present uh, the histogram of the number of links served by the macrobase station. Uh, remember that the higher the percentage of passengers in the system, the higher the number of passengers in each bus. Uh, thus, when uh, we were serving, a, when a macro was serving a bus, this macro also served, uh, also serves, of course, all its passengers. Thus, when a bus disconnects from one macro, the load in the macro suddenly changes a lot since all the passengers go away together with the bus. That's why, for example, here in this first case here, this first uh, figure is related to the case where we had. 75% of passengers. Uh, and we had like one, two, three, three, four, five, six, uh, like peaks here. And six peaks is related to the six buses. So for example, in a few times, one, uh, one marker was serving all the six buses, for example. But when one bus, for example, here disconnects, so for example, when you go from uh, three to two, we see that all the, passengers go goes away with the bus so the the load uh, decreases also it's not a smooth uh, decrease we had the peaks relate to the number of buses that were being served uh, thus to, due to the variability of the loads that we see in these figures in order to avoid overloading one cell while another cell is still lightly loaded we think that we should consider adopting topology adaptation strategies based on the macro BS's loads. I mean, uh, for example, if one uh, macro base station is already serving, for example, in this case, four buses, maybe uh, the next bus should connect to another macro if it's possible in order to avoid overloading this macro base station here, for example. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about the backhaul links. Here we have the histogram of the number of links served in the backhaul. Since in the backhaul, the macro basis stations are serving links from the buses, one would expect that through the backhaul, the macro would serve a number of links multiple of the number of passengers per bus. So for example, if the bus is serving 10, if there are 10 passengers in the bus, one could expect, for example, 10 links uh, in the backhaul related to the 10 passages, for example. But in some cases, uh, we can see that we had, for example, uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit more than the number of passengers. And this is explained by the fact that some buses were serving not only the passengers, but also pedestrians. That's we have, that's why we had some peaks here, which are uh, in the, the peaks here are related to the number of uh, passengers. And here we have the number of passengers plus one or two, for example, which are the pedestrians that are connected to the bus. So their links were, all, were also going through the backhaul. And now let's talk a little bit about the access links. Uh, here we have the histogram of the percentage. So here is the person, uh, this axis here is the percentage of links served by the macro base station uh, that were access links. So uh, for example, if we had uh, 10 uh, links served by the macro, some of them were backhaul and other, other, uh, others were access. So here I'm presenting the percentage of links that were access links. Uh, notice that the type of the links served by the macro was uh, has a high variability. So we have here a high variability between access and backhaul links. Uh, thus, we think that dynamic spectrum partitioning uh, should be taken should be considered. Since, for example, in this case here, uh, we had just 20% of links in the access, but here we have 80%. So this percentage fluctuates uh, during the simulation. So maybe we should use a dynamic spectrum partition. So when we have 
uh, more uh, links uh, that are access links. So uh, the donor should have should give more uh, resources uh, to these access links. But on the other hand, when we have an overloaded backhaul, so the donor should prioritize the backhaul. And here uh, we see these peaks here in 100%. Uh, and 100% of access means, means that uh, in this case here, uh, the donors were not serving in these moments uh, buses. So there were not backhaul needs in service. In this case here, they were only serving uh, access needs. Okay, now uh, Rafael will continue here. Thank you. Thank you, Vector. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, so uh, now we go to the. Just a second. Now we go to lesson learned and open issue in future directions. So based on on the literature review that we have uh, done in the article and also based on the simulations that were just presented, we have some conclusions and some future work that we can talk about mobile ID. So firstly, about cell planning and mobility management, we, consider, we can consider here two cases. Firstly, when the vehicle have well-defined trajectories, uh, we have some aspects that can be optimized in the network. For example, the IB donor deployment, uh, can uh, the IB donor can be uh, deployed in strategic places, for example, along the railway track, in order to keep a good connection to the mobile IB nodes. This is a first aspect. Also, as the, the vehicles have a well-defined trajectories, we can also pre-configure the topology adaptation because we know that um, a, a node is moving in the direction of another parent. So we can pre-configure the, the topology adaptation and we can also perform the topology adaptation based on estimate, estimated load of the vehicle, estimated load of the, the parent node. So all of this can take advantage of this, uh, 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 this like randomness of the network. However, when the vehicles do not have well-known trajectories, uh, firstly, we can use uh, some strategies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, prediction method to, to try to learn the possible trajectories of the nodes. And then after that, we can employ the same, uh, optimize the same aspects as I said before, for example, IB node deployment or pre-configured topology adaptation. This is our first aspect. We can also talk about interference management. This is, is very relevant uh, in mobile IB scenario, especially when we consider in-band mobile IB in the case where backhaul and access transmission use the same set of resources. Uh, basically, when we have mobile IB, not only the UEs are moving, but we also have, have the, the IB nodes are moving. So we have a dynamic interference in this case. So uh, some functionality that can be optimized in this case is the power control for UEs that are connected to the mobile IB in order to reduce the interference that these UEs cause in the other nodes of the, the network. We can also consider the, the, uh, an optimization of the TDD frame, a uh, special design of the TDD frame in order to reduce your control interference. For example, inserting some silence slots, as Victor said before. Another aspect that can be, uh, be considered as a future direction, and Victor also mentioned this in his presentation, is the bandwidth allocation between access and backhaul. Uh, use just a fixed split between access and backhaul is not efficient and not the optimal solution. As Victor sh has shown in the simulation, we have a, a, a load that is dynamic and is varying all the time. Uh, the, the number of UEs connected to the macro base station, the number of we connected to the uh, to the IB nodes. So this vary a lot. So we can consider a dynamic spectrum spectrum partitioning between access and backhaul. For example, considering data load that is carried by each node or quality of service constraints. 
another aspect that uh, can be considered as a promising future direction is about antenna deployment. Uh, we, when we talk about uh, mobile IB that are using buses and train, we need outside antennas, for example, for a backhaul and some antennas inside of the bus or the train in order for access transmission. But when we think about a multiple operator scenario where we have different operators that are uh, uh, offering service, service for the UEs inside of a bus, we can uh, think about how the hardware of the different operator are organized. For example, will each operator has our equipment in the bus or the infrastructure can be shared among them? This is a, a practical, practical uh, question that can be made in this scenario. Uh, we can also, about antenna deployment, we can also think uh, how, what is the best way to, to serve onboard UEs and also to serve pedestrian UEs. For example, could we put uh, some antennas of the distributed unit part inside the bus and uh, some distributed unit antennas outside the bus in order to serve pedestrians? This is uh, uh, an open issue. Uh, as I said before, UAV is not uh, being considered for mobile IB. However, this is a, a, an important technology for uh, future uh, mobile network, uh, 6G, for example. So we can think uh, that the interplay between mobile IB and U UAV is a, a promising direction, for example, in order to improve coverage, coverage and also for mission critical scenarios. And finally, uh, our last topic is about signaling optimization for group handover. I had, had just explained about the intercentral unit topology adaptation. That is the case when the mobile IB migrates from uh, an old parent to a new parent, and both parents are served by different central units. So in this case, uh, uh, if we had a conventional handover, all UEs that are connected to the mobile IB should perform uh, uh, an XN handover and including, for example, random access procedure. But random access procedure is not needed in this case because the best, uh, uh, strongest cell for these UEs that are inside of the bus uh, has not changed. It's, it's still the DU part inside the bus. So group signaling and uh, optimization of the handover messages when we have group handover is a, a promising topic also for future direction. So about the conclusions, uh, so uh, Mobile IB is it's a candidate solution to address at least two challenges of current networks. Firstly, enhance the service of moving UEs, uh, can guarantee, for example, that the UEs are already connected to the networks, and also can optimize the group handover, as I just explained. And also Mobile IB can allow a quick deployment of new cells uh, in, for example, in some areas that are, are high demanding, for example, needing high data rates. About our work, we consider in the simulation a uh, urban macro scenario where we have the IAB nodes deployed inside the buses. And we had some conclusions, for example, uh, that the deal part inside of the bus, the NMT part outside the bus has uh, uh, contributed to a good quality of the passengers, of the service that is provided to the passengers in terms of throughput and latency. We could see from the results that were presented by Vito that an admission policy is important to a mobile IB in order to decrease the probability of have pedestrian connected to the mobile IB uh, with a poor quality of service. And also, that uh, someone should, should adopt a topology adaptation, a TDD scheme, in order to, to tackle the problem of interference manage management. Okay. So just to remark our recent publications, the journal paper that I had saw, I had I have said before, and we also had a conference publication, the Globicon publishing this this month about TDD frame design. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you, Rafael and Victor. Really a very interesting presentation and an up-to-date uh, topic. So we'll start by taking questions. And we already actually have one question in the chat from one of the attendees. So he is asking, how can all these uh, micro IABs uh, organize, uh, uh, mobile, sorry, IABs organize between each other without any conflict? Is there any central computing for that, especially your study using physical layer? Okay, uh, I don't know if I got correct, uh, exactly the question, but uh, about how, uh, if there is a central unity, when we have just let, so when we have a mobile IB, the mobile IB is connected to uh, an IB donor that uh, serves this mobile IB node through the backhaul. So uh, the IB donor is responsible for uh, managing the resources that are assigned to the backhaul. Mm -hmm. And all the scheduling that happens inside of uh, uh, the bus, for example, is, is over responsibility of the DU part of the mobile IB. But uh, as I also said, uh, when we have an IB network, we have the split uh, between the central unit and the DU part. So uh, from the UE's point of view, uh, the high protocol layers is controlled by the IB donor and the low protocol layers is controlled by the DU part of the IB node. So th that's why when we have a topology adaptation uh, from a, a parent from, with a different central unit part, we need to perform a handover. So uh, I don't know if I, I got exactly the question. Vito would like to, to add something about this. No, actually, I agree with you. Uh, the donor was responsible for, for example, if we think about one donor uh, managing more than one mobile IB node, so the donor was responsible, was responsible for uh, managing the backhaul links of these multiple MIB nodes, but in our and in our simulations, the DU part of each bus was responsible for managing its own uh, resources in the access link. But I think that it could be possible also uh, for the donor uh, to set uh, the bands that each MIB node uh, can use for the access link. So, for example, if we uh, the donor wants it could also set for example just okay so this mobile IB node will use half of the band and there are another uh MIB node will use other part of the band this could also be possible yes so, I, I i also would like summary, to add yes you yes. can say no just in summary the mobile IB donor is responsible for managing uh the mobile IB nodes Yes, and also it's important to say that the transmission uh, in the in IB network is organized by the TDD frame design. Mm -hmm. So that with the TDD frame, we can see the moment that the, for example, the IB node can transmit in uplink, in downlink, and can be silent also. This is managed by the TDD frame design. Okay, so, okay. Any other questions from the uh, audience? Okay, so we have actually um, a follow up from these um, from the same speaker who asked the question. So he says, I mean, each donor IAB will connect with IAB node, uh, but you say that there are uh, IAB node will connect. If you, um, whoever asked the question, if you want, you can ask it uh, live. I mean, so that uh, it might be easier to grasp it if that's possible. Uh, many thanks for this uh, presentation. Uh, my Thank sound you. or my voice is clear? Yeah, it's very clear. Yes. Yeah, you, go yes. ahead. Thank you. Uh, you talk about uh, that IAB node or YAB node will uh, connect to another YAB node. That's true or not? So um, when we talk about uh, there th that there is only uh, one donor will connect to only one node. You talk now right now 
right here. Okay, no, previous slide, please. Next slide. No, previous, previous one. Previous. Yeah. This one. No. Uh, uh, no, no. Uh, when w the, the slide, the slide contain two IP no IP nodes. Maybe this one. The next one, please. Okay. When when we talk about enter and enter C A like that. Okay. Uh, here there are two IB nodes. Connect IB uh, Yab node two right. and Yab node and uh, and Yab node four. That's right. When we talk, of... yes, please, please get yes, it. yes. Uh, the scenario uh, uh, or your scenario talk about only uh, Yab node with Yab donor one tier, or uh, it can uh, uh, apply for two tier uh, Yab uh, Yab with node and node with node. We have considered this one tier. So that so that I asked. Uh, so so that I asked. Uh, is there any uh, uh, central uh, computing for that? Please, Vito, would you say something? Me? Victor? Yes, oh. no, actually, uh, uh, now I got it, your, your question. Yes, uh, actually, uh, we consider that one IAB node could only con uh, connect to the IAB donor. And yes, in our simulation, uh, the connection was based on RSRP, uh, so the strongest uh, link, but only connect, only uh, it, one bus was not allowed to connect it to other bus. So one bus could do, couldn't be the donor of another bus. Yes, yeah. important to say that this is a requirement. This is a constraint of the uh, mobile IB work item. Uh, mobile IB cannot connect to another mobile IB. A mobile IB can only connect to an uh, IB donor. On. Okay. So, uh, uh, IB donor, mobile IB node. There is no IB node uh, after mobile donor. Yes. Uh, the, we cannot connect a mobile IB, a bus to another bus. We can only connect a bus to an IB donor. An okay. IB donor can connect, can serve in backhaul several, for example, several buses. Okay, so we can say that uh, uh, IB node four or Yab node four. Uh, uh, in your scenario, uh, there's uh, there's no uh, or uh, there is there isn't exist there isn't exist in your scenario. Yes, uh, uh, when I talk about this slide, I was talking about integrated access I, uh, uh, backhaul. So we have a fixed IB network. In a fixed IB okay. network where the IB nodes are fixed, uh, it's possible we have multiple hops. But in the mobile IB scenario, it's not possible a scenario like this. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, OK, thank you. Many thanks. Thank you uh, for the uh, question and for the comprehensive answer. Okay, I have just, uh, if there are no more questions, I have one general question. So uh, everyone's talking now, you know, about uh, 5G and even beyond 5G networks. And uh, I know, Rafael, you mentioned um, uh, several applications that uh, could be uh, uh, where the mobile IABs basically could be used. But where do you see, like, basically uh, their highlight? Um, in, in which, what type of applications, if you can summarize for either 5G networks or even beyond 5G application, uh, 5G network? Here I'm talking about applications or use cases, like the ones that uh, uh, you mentioned before, but if you can restress on, on those again. As I can start, then Victor can complement. Uh, uh, in my view, I think one key scenario is uh, to apply mobile IB, for example, in, in, as shown in this picture, in, in buses, for example, mm -hmm. in trains, in order to, to to improve the quality of the passengers. This is a current scenario that we can see in 5G networks. And if we think uh, uh, ahead uh, in a next generation network, we can think in an integration 
uh, of Mobile IB with uh, UAV, for, mm -hmm. for example, in, in mission critical uh, scenarios, as I said before. Victor, do you want to add anything or? No, actually, these are, I think, uh, the main scenarios uh, that we are working. Uh, so, mobile AB can uh, improve the quality of the connections of uh, passengers. So, for example, mm -hmm. trains and buses. And this not only improves the quality itself, but also it uh, avoids, for example, uh, an overloading. For example, when the train is arriving next. Uh, to the train station, mm -hmm. if all the passengers will try to connect to the donor uh, by itself, so it's a lot of, uh, it's a overloading signal, right? So yeah. if we have this mobile ID, the mobile ID can be like a, a bridge between the donor and all the passengers that are arriving at the same time. At the same time. And also, as uh, Rafael said, uh, not only mobile ID itself, but also IAB in general can be used in emergency scenarios. So, for example, when we have an accident, so in, for example, in, in an accident uh, where the, the closest base station uh, is not working anymore, so we, we, you don't have time to deploy, for example, fiber and, re, and build another base station to serve that area. So, in this case, we can uh, deploy an IAB node there with a wireless backhaul to serve uh, with the connect wireless connection that area. I think this is another use case for IAB. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can see a lot of potential actually for uh, IABs and mobile IABs in general. So thank you very much for this interesting talk. Uh, thank you, Rafael and Victor and all the attendees. And uh, yeah, have, have a good day, everyone. So I'll end it here. Thank you for having us in this presentation. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, if we have